The Club Q shooting suspect shows his face in court, the one pummeled to a pulp by the people who stopped him. Pulse nightclub shooting survivors are coming to Colorado to offer their unique support. Do you ever think you'd see a day when Colorado Springs City Hall is draped in an enormous pride flag? This one travels the country when the best and worst of America is on display. And the generosity you've displayed for the people most impacted by the shooting says something about you and about Colorado. All that is next. The suspected Club Q shooter came to court today. A quick look at the suspect proved what we'd heard. The people inside that club who stopped the massacre beat the living hell out of the suspect in the process. Anderson Aldrich's defense team says their client identifies as non-binary, so that's how we'll refer to them from here on out. Suspect appeared in court today by remote video. Judge ordered prosecutors to let the defense see the sealed arrest warrant. Suspects being held on suspicion of five counts of first-degree murder, five counts of a bias-motivated crime. Prosecutors say they'll review the evidence before they file formal charges. We expect many more. Next significant court appearance will be a preliminary hearing where prosecutors will prove that there's probable cause to take the suspect to trial. Few people have a better idea of what the Club Q survivors are going through than the survivors of the Pulse nightclub shooting. So some of them are going to come to the Springs to offer whatever support they can. Our Steve Stager caught up with one Pulse shooting survivor who won't have to go far. You know, it was a little numbing at first to have it happen right in your backyard again. Josh Garcia knows this pain too well. One of the managers of Orlando's Pulse nightclub, he was outside the club the night 49 people were murdered inside six and a half years ago. Now he's here. The biggest decision is our daughter. So we just decided to move here. So we have a, a daughter who came to visit Colorado Springs and just fell in love with the people here. News of a mass shooting always hits him hard. This one especially stung. Immediately my heart sank down just knowing that there's a a new group of people that are going to have to live with this for the rest of their lives. I sat in shock. Barbara Poma watched the news from back in Orlando. This one is just so close to home. Like you said, it is the same community. It is the same situation. She owns Pulse Nightclub and now leads the foundation of survivors dedicated to helping others. They're coming soon to offer their support. We know right now that they are going to be in this state of shock and trauma and fog. Um, I, we remember ours all too well. Mine lasts at least a couple years. We hope to make leave them with ways to contact us, but let them know that we're here when they're ready and everyone is ready at different times. Questions pop up at different times. And so we just want them to know that we are a resource for them. Garcia will support survivors of a tragedy he knows all too well in a community he now calls home through an outlet that helped him cope. I got involved right after with art therapy and now run an organization that we respond to tragedies um, through art. One community supporting another. The sad cycle continues. You're never alone. Um, unfortunately, you'll hear this more often now that you're a part of this club that nobody wants to be a part of, but it's full of so much love and support. Josh works with an organization called Stars of Hope. They travel to communities where these tragedies happen, then they offer a shared space where people can express themselves together. And what they find is as survivors create, they start to share with each other, and that is therapeutic. He says that the group has already started to do some work outside Club Q. In fact, one of the things they're trying to focus on right now is they want to work on downtown Colorado Springs because he says the holidays are coming up, mm -hmm. which are often incredibly difficult times for people who have been through something like this. So sure. they want to do something to try to like brighten up downtown and remind people that it's okay to allow yourself to celebrate the holidays, even though this awfully horrific thing just happened. To have joy amid grief. I yes. mean, at some point it goes beyond just like little pockets of people who have experience with mass shootings because we see so many of them now, right? We talked about it uh, with both of them today. It's like every single incident is a community, but all of a sudden now we've seen so much of it, it's almost like a society of survivors who all come together in these events and all offer support. I've talked to survivors from most of the mass shootings that we've witnessed here in Colorado that I've reported on who are all offering help to Club Q right now. It's just a massive community, if not a society of survivors. Yeah, a society of survivors. Wow. All right, Steve, thank you. An enormous pride flag that's been present for some of the greatest victories and some of the saddest moments in American LGBTQ history is now draped down the front of Colorado Springs City Hall. 
It's known as the sacred cloth flag. It's a section of this enormous Rainbow 25 flag sewn in 2003 by Gilbert Baker, the creator of the original Pride flag. That Rainbow 25 flag was more than a mile long, and it was eventually sectioned off into pieces. One of those pieces has become known as the sacred cloth. It's traveled the world, flying at Pride events, and protests in small towns, especially where the LGBTQ community could use extra support. It even went to the steps of the Supreme Court in 2015 to support the couples involved in the historic marriage equality case. And it was unfurled on the steps of the Supreme Court building, and we had no idea of the power that the flag held until that day. You know, the Supreme Court uh, folks uh, saw it as they marched up the steps and into the hearings. Um, and to them, it was a battle flag. In 2016, the flag became part of the healing process for the survivors at the Pulse nightclub, and it now goes back to Orlando to fly each year on the day of the shooting. The flag is normally escorted by handlers wherever it goes, but the people at the Sacred Cloth Project said that they broke with that tradition and decided to ship it to Colorado Springs to get it here more quickly. We wanted to make sure that Colorado Springs was able to give the community uh, the solace it needed um, in a moment's notice. I gave them explicit instructions that uh, those people uh, in the community there, regardless of who they are, gay, straight, bisexual, whatever, it doesn't make any difference to me, if they need to touch that flag or see it, that it's, it's, it's available to them to do. Um, that's, what it, that's what it does. Certainly is striking to see it draped over the Colorado Springs City Hall. The organizers at the Sacred Cloth Project say that flag can stay at City Hall as long as the community needs it there. The shooting in the Springs has raised good questions about the state's red flag law, which allows law enforcement to temporarily seize guns from a person deemed dangerous by a judge. Tonight's next question comes to us from a viewer named Craig. Craig wanted to know whether law enforcement has to follow a judge's red flag order and what happens if officers refuse to take someone's guns. So, Craig, first off, just want to stress, we've seen no evidence that there was a red flag order against the suspect in the Club Q shooting. We have reported that El Paso County Sheriff Bill Elder opposes the red flag law and has said that his office won't seek to use it. We've heard other conservative sheriffs say the same. Legally, though, it's not clear what would happen if a law enforcement agency refused to enforce a judge's red flag order on someone. The attorney general's office told us, generally speaking, without specific case law on this instance, people can be held in contempt of court if they refuse a judge's order. We welcome any of your questions about what happened at Club Q and what is going to be happening next in the process. It's possible that you're thinking about something that we haven't and we haven't talked about at length here. Email us any questions you have to next at 9news.com. I have to hope that one thing that comes out of the horrific attack on Club Q is that Colorado's LGBTQ community sees how many Coloradans have their backs. Hope that people now realize that standing silently while others incite hate and anger and bigotry. Standing by is not going to cut it. It's time to be intentional about saying that this is a state where people are free to be who they are and that people should be able to live free of fear. Pretty basic, right? I appreciate how many of you have shown that support in a variety of ways since Sunday, including everyone who's given to the Colorado Healing Fund to support the victims' families, survivors, and the broader community in the Springs. Your Word of Thanks campaign to support the Colorado Healing Fund this week has raised $90,000 and counting. This is the fund that Club Q is directing people to give to if they'd like. The nonprofit already has money out the door to help with immediate expenses, medical costs, memorial service expenses, travel costs. And while we have no idea how much money will be raised in total, we know that the bulk of it will go to those most impacted by the shooting, and that a portion is expected to be set aside for projects that will work toward long-term healing and support for the LGBTQ community in the Springs. The Colorado Healing Fund is working with well-known LGBTQ nonprofits, including One Colorado and the Gill Foundation, to make sure that the needs of the community are front and center in the process. And also, so the people impacted who may not feel comfortable going to law enforcement that they might have a path to receiving assistance as well. Scan the QR code on your screen to get that link to join me in donating, or you can find the donation link on the next section of 9news.com or on any of our social media accounts. Those impacted by the Club Q shooting are just now coming to grips with what they have lost and perhaps what they'll need. With our help, the Colorado Healing Fund will be there for those needs now and in the future. Ambulance crews are struggling to keep up with calls from the city to rural areas. The state is stepping in to get some more paramedics on the job. A turkey 
that won't end up on anyone's Thanksgiving table. Nobody's gonna hurt Stu. He's, he's gonna survive Thanksgiving, I guarantee it. A golf course owner introduces us to his delicious friend. Again, no one is eating Stu. That's next. Paramedics are calling for help. They're overwhelmed by the number of calls they're getting, especially in rural Colorado. They took those concerns to the Capitol, where agencies that have a good amount of funding and others that don't came up with a solution. Here's Anusha Roy. It's been a tough few years for paramedics with the number of calls going up, including through COVID. You know, Denver paramedics this year, we're going to run about 100, we're going to say about 125,000 calls this year. But that's just the start. More people are calling 911. Um, faster than our city is growing. There's more traffic, more time spent on scene as people have been asking more questions about their care and high rises impacting response times. It used to be pulling up to a front of the house is now pulling up to the front of the house, going through a foyer, waiting for an elevator to get up to the seventh, eighth, 12th floor. Then there are hospitals that are full and at times paramedics are waiting for several minutes for an available bed. Um, you know, of the 12, 12 of the past 14 years, we've met those response time uh, metrics that we target. Um, but there are years that, that we've struggled because of the growth and some of these challenges. Are we in one of those years right now? Literally? Yes, it is. And that's the stress on Denver Health Paramedics, the state's busiest EMS service with a different set of resources than in rural Colorado. The calls for help there are going up as well. People utilizing the, uh, the, the amazing backcountry in Colorado, and then people got hurt or got stuck in the backcountry. And so EMS was actually, and uh, backcountry search and rescue teams were busier than they ever have been over the last few years. Year. But as Democratic Senator-elect Dylan Roberts heard during testimony, some areas have one ambulance or share one with a neighboring city or county. We're waiting an hour, maybe even two hours uh, for a heart attack response or for an emergency response in the backcountry. Colorado is also the only state in the country that does not have a state-level regulatory system for ground ambulances. There's no regulatory oversight. There was no consumer protection. So an idea was born, debated, and then passed into law that utilizes that last point. It requires ambulance operators to be licensed by the state and meet state requirements. Those applications and licenses will come with a fee. That money will then be pooled to help under-resourced departments and afford more resources, which is anticipated to reach mostly rural Colorado departments. So everyone I was talking to said that paramedics in rural Colorado, they're doing good work. They're just doing the best they can with the resources they have. So the idea is that every county will have its own ambulance or maybe multiple ambulances. They'll have more money to hire more paramedics and the medical supplies. The question is, will those fees cover that cost? And the task force, Kyle, is still working out those details. So we don't have those numbers yet. The problem is so acute in rural Colorado. You were telling me that even in Denver, we have a situation where the number of calls is outpacing just like the population growth. Yeah, and the chief was saying that one of the reasons could be that people don't always know how to access care, but what they do know is 911. So they really want to keep utilizing things like the STAR program that connects you to behavioral health help, nursing hotlines to figure out, you know, what care can we get people that may not always require an ambulance, the police, as well as the fire department. Yeah, you wonder how many municipalities will go to that model where they kind of triage 911 calls right. and say, I'm sorry, you, you don't need an ambulance. You, you need to go to urgent right. care. You need this or that. Anusha, thank you. Well, a cold front moved into the area, and if you've been outside, you can certainly fill it with that cold breeze coming through. We're at 41 degrees at DIA right now, where it feels like 34 with those winds coming down from the north at around 13 miles per hour. So if you're behind that cold front, you're going to start to see those northern winds, and you can definitely feel that cold air pushing its way in. Some areas already starting to get some snowfall, so we have some winter weather advisories that will be in effect until early tomorrow morning. Up to the north, Elkhead, Park Mountain's flat tops will see maybe around four to seven inches of snowfall, mainly above 8,500 feet there. So we're going to watch for that and uh, along with strong winds across the state. And then to the south, this is going to be the South San Greta Cristo Mountains and uh, the southern portions of the I-25 corridor. We're going to watch for maybe around two to six inches across the I-25 corridor, five to 10 inches of snow in the higher elevations to the south, winds gusting around 45 miles per hour. So where we are seeing these winds are the snow. We're also going to see strong winds creating blowing snow. As far as the front range 
We're going to see maybe a dusting of snow around Denver. You could see maybe up to one or two inches across the foothills and high country, then to the south across the Palmer Divide between uh, Denver and Colorado Springs. On to our HD Doppler radar, where we are starting to see that light snowfall is going to mostly be in the high country and portions of the western slope. We stay dry for the early evening tonight here in Denver. 26 degrees expected as our low. Tomorrow, we're going to watch for a light dusting of snow out there. Highs maxing out in the upper 30s. Going to be cold and windy for our Thanksgiving. Hit a birdie at Bear Creek Golf Course and you'll have to answer to his friend, the owner. He's definitely gotten a lot bigger over the last six months. I, I, I thought they were fattening him up for Thanksgiving. His name's Stu. He's on the course, not on the menu. That's next. Workers at the Bear Creek Golf Course in Lakewood have been fattening up a turkey ahead of Thanksgiving. Not for culinary purposes. Stu is just their friend. We're at Bear Creek Golf Club. We have seen bears, we've seen um, wildcats, we have a lot of coyotes. Rabbits and squirrels and deer, elk, <laughs> and stew. I've been here for 20 years, and this is the first time we've seen a turkey here. He's interesting to have around. <laughs> you know, he does this a lot, stands in front of the door and just kind of talks. Six, eight months ago, he was down on number hole number seven here at Bear Creek. Now it's no longer the turkey. It's, hi, Stu, how are you today? <laughs> See you, Stu. Chase Hunter, yeah, he's our unofficial mascot. You know, we had t-shirts made honoring Stu. It's not a lot of middle of the road here. Either the members love him or they hate him. Oh, yeah, I, I kind of thought we should put together all of everybody's cell phone videos for a Christmas party. Oh, and just have a like montage of people getting chased around the parking lot, around the course. Hello. Put it to like the Benny Hill music. <laughs> I just know that when he comes around, I always just try to stay away from him. You know, he's definitely gotten a lot bigger over the last six months. I, I thought they were fattening him up for Thanksgiving. We came to pick up our Thanksgiving dinner. Oh, he's picking up. Hey, Stu, they're picking up you. They're picking up one of your cousins. Nobody's going to hurt Stu. He's, he's going to survive Thanksgiving, I guarantee it. That was a nice diversion, wasn't it? Your feedback tonight includes some tough questions about the spring shooting. So we'll take on a couple of them next. When the worst happens in Colorado, you, next viewers, are reliably part of the goodness that comes after. I just looked at this week's Word of Thanks microgiving campaign to support the Colorado Healing Fund, which is already helping the Clubview victims and families and survivors of the community. You have raised nearly $100,000 for that effort. You can scan the QR code on your screen to get that link to donate or find the link in the next section of 9news.com. Greg writes in tonight to say, why aren't any of the news outlets, especially next, talking about the other hero who subdued the shooter. So we know about Rich Fierro, uh, the veteran who took down the shooter. We know that there was another person, Thomas James, who's currently in the Navy. That's all that law enforcement has said. We have reached out to Thomas James. We've reached out to Thomas James's family. At the end of the day, it's that person's decision whether or not to share their story. And Bill says, how much responsibility should county officials have for not enforcing the red flag law? Well, they're elected officials, so they'll have exactly as much responsibility as voters want to assign them. We'll see you next time.